Now we're going to talk about the benefits of public speaking because there are a lot of benefits. And uh, I would say that uh, when you look here, you see these three, and that's enhancing personal satisfaction, influence in the world, and advancing your career. So let me talk about those three. I think specifically that um, enhancing your personal satisfaction is that you can have a coherent conversation with someone and they say, golly, that was something really smart to say. The other day, my brother and I were talking about um, critical thinking and what goes into critical thinking. And he said, oh, um, so we start talking about some topic. And he does a really good summary of it. And I said, hey, that's, that's some really good critical thinking. I said, here are the questions I would ask. What assumptions are they making? And when they make those assumptions, what are the behaviors they're engaging in because of those assumptions that they make? And I even went deeper and deeper and deeper. And he said, how do you do that? I said, how do I do what? He said, how can you go so deep into a topic without knowing about it? And so I said, it's, it's, it's critical thinking. And it's, it's being able to ask questions that draw out more information. So I thought that was very interesting and very nice of my brother to say that. When we talk about influencing the world and advancing the career, really, first of all, you have to identify how do you want to influence the world. I enjoy influencing the world of education through community colleges in a couple of different ways. One, with teaching about communication processes, which include public speaking, and also professional development. I, my full-time job is doing professional development. I do professional development sessions on topics such as crucial conversations, laughter yoga, on listening, nonverbal communication. I help put together retreats. I coach people in their communication skills. I do professional development sessions on the seven habits of highly effective people, the seven habits of highly effective managers, and really what anyone asks for. I, I do safety training. I don't, I, that one I just help put together, but I do training on open workspaces where you don't have a door, no one has a door. And I believe I influence higher education in that way by helping employees and staff and faculty be better for themselves so that they can be better for the students that they serve and serving each other. I enjoy teaching because I hope that I impact you all positively so that you understand the importance of communication, the positives of communication, and understand how your life really can be better if you become a public speaker. But if you broaden your definition and not just keep it narrow, public speaking is only when I get up and stand in front of people and deliver a speech. And that's a whole lot more than that. I want you to broaden that example of public speaking. And when you broaden that, exam, uh, that uh, definition of public speaking and think about how you can have a better life because of it, then that's where I feel like I have impacted you and that makes me feel good. You have to define what personal satisfaction is for you. It's different for all people. You have to define what influence in the world means to you and you have to define what advance in your career means to you. I get a lot of students that will ask me, so Miss Edgar, I uh, have a, a situation at work where I have to talk about this project that I've been working on and I, I don't know how to do it and can you help me? So, you know, I give them some pointers, some things they can do. And if we've gone through the public speaking part of it, you know, I use those tools and I have students come back and say, oh my gosh, it went so great. 
everybody heard me. They were impressed. I knew what I was talking about because I landed the plane. You know, when you land a plane, you just don't say, well, I'm going to land now. Whoop! No, they have to flick switches, turn knobs, do this, do that, navigate. They have to find a path to take. After they find that path, you know, they're slowing down, they're speeding up. There's all these things that have to take place in order for them to get to this point right here. It's the same thing in communication. I have this big message, and it's, in public speaking, it's my nonverbals, it's my verbals, it's my the tone that I use, it's the eye contact that I make, and boop, well, at the beginning I landed by giving you a definition very quickly. I said, hey, here's what it is. And then I said, we're going to talk about this some more, right? So these are the parts of it. This flying right here, I am using Screencast-O-Matic, okay? That's the channel I've chosen to send this message. I decided instead of a PowerPoint with a voiceover, I wanted more FaceTime with you. I want you to have more FaceTime with me. That's part of landing the plane. You're making eye contact with me. You're seeing me in my corny jokes, you know, and and you are getting an instructor who's writing on the board, who's looking at you that you can rewind and listen to, rewind and listen to her again, or listen to it and turn me off, <laughs> whatever you want to do. All of that is a part of landing the plane for any message that you are delivering. But in this particular instance, it is that public speaking has a broader definition than what you might think it is. And that you can, if you learn the process, of public speaking, then you can do it any place, anytime, anywhere, and you can ha increase your personal satisfaction, influence the world, and advance your career. Okay? Now then I'm going to do this right here to see if you have any questions. If you have any questions, I'm going to have a discussion board where you can ask me questions and I will answer them for you. Now then, let's move on to um, talking about, uh, we've already talked about informative versus persuasive. Let me talk a little bit about uh, special occasion speeches. Special occasion, and I always forget how to spell that word. It, okay. A special occasion speech is, I think for me, I'll just be real honest, probably one of the toughest ones, toughest speeches that I have to give. They're the ones that make me the most nervous. And let me tell you a story about a special occasion speech. I was asked to come out to Mountain View because that, that's where I graduated from. And I used to be in Phi Theta Kappa. I was the president of Phi Theta Kappa, secretary of Phi Theta Kappa. I was a student assistant at Mountain View College, and um, so I, after I graduated in the workplace, I was asked to come back and give a, uh, that was to be the keynote speaker for uh, a Phi Theta Kappa thing they were doing, and I was just absolutely honored, and I, it's a special occasion speech because the special occasion is for Phi Theta Kappans. And I get up to speak, and two different things happen to me, okay? I was ready. I had my notes. I was ready. So the first thing that happened was I'd had a really busy day during the day. I ran home, changed clothes, changed in the dark, got there, sitting on the front row. As I'm being introduced, I look down at my shoes, and I notice I have a blue one on and a black one on. So I think, okay, uh, I can get by this. I'll just stand behind the podium. The podium was clear, like you could see through it. So I'm sitting there thinking while I'm being introduced, okay, I'm just going to have to make a joke about it. So when I got up there and I thanked them for introducing me, I said, this is going to be a little like a Jay Leno act. I'm going to start with, so on my way here this evening, you know, because those jokes start with that. And I told them about my shoes, showed them my shoes. And we had a good laugh about it. 
Ah, that wasn't the only thing that happened to me during that speech. So about halfway through, half my notes in front of me, doing great. People are laughing. They're making eye contact with me. Some are taking notes. I see at the very back a young man who's doing this. was like, what is this? He, what is he doing? And then I recognized him. He was in several of my TCU classes. A whole bunch of people in this room. And all of a sudden, I quit thinking about my speech. And I'm thinking about him. But my mouth is still speaking my speech. I have no idea what I said for probably 10 to 15, 20 seconds. Could have been 30 seconds. I had no idea what I said because I was thinking, oh my gosh, here's one of my classmates from TC with several communication classes together. How exciting to see him. I, can, I mean, all that's going on in my head while I'm delivering my special location speech right here. <laughs> when I realized I had checked out of my own speech, I touched the podium and I leaned forward and I looked at everybody. They had no idea I'd forgotten my speech. I mean, I had no idea where I was. I said, oh, I said a dirty word in my brain. I won't say it on this, but I said a dirty word. What am I going to do? And while I'm looking at these people, I don't even know where I am. What the heck am I going to do? So I did what I teach people to do. And I looked down at my notes. Well, since I didn't know where I stopped, I didn't know where to start. I just picked a spot and went with it. Their perception of that pause was that I was about to say something so important. It was going to be so great. And it was great. <laughs> they liked it. They clapped, you know. So things happened. That was a special occasion speech at Milton College you many years ago. And I made it through it. Special occasion speeches. Someone asks you to do a speech on a particular topic. That is a special occasion speech. If at your workplace someone comes to deliver a speech, teach you all something, that's a special occasion speech. When you go to a wedding and give a wedding speech, a funeral, a funeral speech. The only time that I have ever come close to passing out during the speech was my grandmother died and I had my notes in front of me I had gone and talked to family members put stories together and when I got to my own story that I was telling about my grandmother I was telling the story about her teaching me how to make a cultural Hispanic dish Mexican dish menudo and I spent several days with her and she taught me more recipes than that but this is the one that I really remember and so while I'm telling the story I don't really realize that um, I'm not breathing as deeply and I hadn't eaten very much hadn't had a lot to drink and so I started making the point that when I make a uh, make them a noodle um, or she'll stop having tamales and I think the specific example was with the tamales. When I'm doing this with my tamales, my hands are my grandmother's hands. My grandmother's hands are her mother's hands and her grandmother's hands. So this, when I am making that traditional dish of tamales, it's from all my women relatives that have passed on before me. And at that point, I could feel the tears welling up, hadn't cried until then. Everything just hit me all at once, all the emotions. My knees got weak. I grabbed onto the podium and because I know what's happening to me, because this is what I teach. I told myself, Alma, breathe deep. Move your legs back and forth, okay? Just do a little roll shoulder, and I was doing this up there. And people know when you're in funerals, and your people know that you're just trying to gather yourselves back, right? Gather yourself back. So I was able to catch myself from passing out, 
finished and was proud that I didn't pass out. I was getting ready to leave the podium and I realized there was three steps down and I really didn't know. My legs were noodly. I didn't know if I could make it. So as I'm trying to get down the stairs, the poor person who was sitting in the front row, I thought, scoot it all over. I'm sitting right there at the end because I didn't know if I could make it any further. Yeah. All the special occasion speeches I've done haven't had something go wrong. And the, you know what? Things happen, and that's okay. Special occasion speeches are for the other person, for other people to celebrate a topic, to celebrate an issue. And uh, a special occasion speeches make us feel good. I think one of the great speeches that I've heard was at a 90th birthday party for my great aunt and she's still working and her family threw her a great big nice party and there were several people four or five people who stood up and gave speeches about her being 90 years old and the impact that she's had on their lives at a pretty happy special occasion speech. Okay, so we have special occasion speeches and we have group speeches is the next one. I love group speeches because you get to share the information with everybody. There are a lot of people who are a part of the process. Maybe there's somebody over here who is going to do the PowerPoint. Maybe somebody else is going to do the research. Maybe you're all going to get on Google Docs and work on the outline together and find the resources together. It's um, When you have group speeches, I think what I particularly enjoy about them is that everybody brings what they know about that topic in, and I get to learn from it because I enjoy learning. But don't get me wrong, group speeches are a lot of work. I have seen some pretty great group student speeches, awesome group student speeches. Uh, in, in my professional life, I've seen some pretty difficult <laughs> group speeches because people didn't know how to put them together. Um, Let's look at, let's move from this now. You've looked at all of these different types of speeches. I'm going to step away here so we can look at this, okay? So, first of all, we started off with this right here. What is public speaking? One of you students asked me that great question. Miss Ever, what do you think it is? I think it's just being clear, getting a message across to one or more people face to face, social media, with a boss, how, oh, like if you're in a homeowners association, the PTA, you're trying to get someone else to understand a particular message. And then we also talked about, let's step down here, okay, we talked about, you know, starting to speak now, understanding that you've probably been doing public speaking, and we just want to give you some tools for how you can do it better. Speaking now means, though, recognizing what your apprehension level of public speaking is. That one means you have no anxiety. A hundred means you have a high level of anxiety and probably can't perform. And one is not any good either because that probably means you're boring, monotone, and you have no humor. We talked about different types of speeches, and introductory speeches like just a regular introduction, a humorous introduction, a how-to culture, impromptu after dinner. We talked about informative and persuasive speeches because there are different types of speeches. And then something that's not in your book, but I would like you to remember, is called a reciprocal speech. A reciprocal speech. Okay, so now then, put it back up here. Now what we're going to do, we are going to talk about what public speakers need to know about the process of communication because communication is a process. It's not, it's not you know, uh, I'm going to send you a message and I'm just going to 
put some words out there and that's the message. That's not the entire message, okay? There's words, there's your nonverbals, there's your face. When I was doing the speech last Friday, the second speech that I was doing, it was on public speaking, I talked to them about the A, B, C's of public speaking. The majority of your message comes from right here, A. This is not in your book, this is me, A. Your eyes send a majority of your message, right? So this is A. This part of your body is B from here down to your waist. And then C is your, like, right, your thighs and, and below. Those are the A, B, C's. We were partic talking particularly about nonverbal communication. So I want to share with you that communication is a process and public speaking is a process. First of all, I want to talk to you about... Um, think about a vehicle. I'm going to try to draw one. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure this is going to work. But I'm going to try. Let's do this. Make sure. Okay. So, communication. Is a process. When you have a process. Okay. There's a lot of steps in the process. Okay. Some processes are linear, which means you have to do this one first, this one second, that one third, that one fourth, that one fifth, to get your product. That's linear. What I'm talking about is more than this, okay? I'm saying that we have a whole bunch of, let's say that this is your communication. We have a whole bunch of things that are happening. And one impacts the other. So this is you right here, okay? And you are delivering your speech here. You're communicating a message. So the components, the process is, first of all, you have to have your words to say. And then you have to have the channel that you're going to send the message. We'll talk about these more in just a moment. Channel, you're going to send the message. Then you have to think about your nonverbals. You have to think about, um, you know, what what is your audience like? Who is your audience? Who are they made up of? Think of our um, election right now. So if you go to the Republican National Convention or the Democratic National Convention, who are their audience members? They're Democrats or they're Republicans. How many of them are there? It's not just the people who are in the audience, but the people who are watching on TV, the people who are watching on the Internet, the people who are listening on the radio, it, it, the people who are participating in Twitter, Facebook, all of those become the audience members and how they're going to receive the message, how they're going to deconstruct your message so that they get their own meaning from it. So that's the audience members. Um, then you have encoding a message, decoding a message. It, there's a lot of things that go on. You have probably the audience members here giving you feedback. Because a really good public speaker will adjust the messages based upon the instant feedback that they're getting from the audience members. What is the context of the speech? What is the environment? But this is what I mean. It makes it so hard to land the plane. Because you have all of this going on. A lot of people think that public speaking is just this right here. It's just the words. It is, public speaking is so much more than the words. Because all of this and your audience, another component is noise. Noise. The example that I gave you of the 
student that I, I mean, the colleague that I saw at the back, I attended TC with him, he was like, that was noise because it interrupted my thought process. The shoes wearing one black and one blue could have been noise and kept me from delivering a good public speech, but I didn't let it. This is a process. One impacts the other. So if you don't have your words prepared and you go on speech day, it is going to have an impact on your nonverbals. You won't be as confident. It is going to have an impact on the noise that's going on in your head. There's internal and external noise. That, you know, let me write that right here. There is internal and then there is external. The internal noise is, you know how confident am I am? What am I telling myself? That's noise. That noise impacts how I'm encoding my message. How do I say the words? In what order do I say the words? What words do I emphasize? Where do I put a pause in? Which influences my nonverbals, which is going to impact the decoding, how that message is decoded. If I have a positive attitude when I step into that public speech, my audience is going to decode that message probably as positive as I'm delivering it. If I deliver it negatively, I'm, I'm not having a good day, I have some low self-esteem going, my nonverbals are like this, I just don't like being here, let's just get through this, they're going to decode those same words much differently, much differently. So when we say that communication is a process, okay, that's passing, communication is, is meaning, getting meaning, passing meaning back and forth. I say something, I want you to decode it so that you understand my meaning. Okay? The, pro the process being there's a whole lot of steps going on. One something impacts another. All of the, and there's so much more. I'm going to give you a, a, a bigger document and you'll see there, all this is going on in a public speech. And it can all become noise unless you organize it. If you don't organize it, You'll have a lot of noise and you won't have a good experience. So all of this is the process of communication. Let's, the audience gives you a lot of feedback. So for instance, this is asynchronous communication. It means you're not on the other side right now giving me instant feedback. But when I put this out there, I'm going to put a link out there for you to put some communication to me out there. That's going to give me feedback. Did you like this way or not? Would you rather me just do no video, all audio? You'll give me feedback on that. And that impact, that, that, um, that feedback impacts future messages, future lectures. Context. So for instance, our context number one is public speaking. Another context is we're online. So that plays into this whole process as well. Okay, so it is very important for you to understand that communication is a process. It doesn't happen easily. Under this heading here, public speaking is a process. Okay, I'm going to erase this now. Public speaking is a communication process. Let me give you one more example. Let's say you have a vehicle and hmm, let's say you've had it for a while. It'll go when you put gas in it. It needs oil and if you're really good about the oil changes then you have more effective vehicle function better use less gas but if you don't put oil in it regularly and um, you don't put good gas in it and you don't I don't know do a couple of other things 
your vehicle will still run, it just won't be as efficient. It'll still run, but it won't be as efficient. When you don't put enough gas in it, it impacts another part of the process. When the oil isn't put in on a regular basis, it impacts another process. When you don't keep up with the electrical, it impacts so many processes. Transmission fluid impacts. Your vehicle will continue to run, but it won't run as efficiently or as effectively. When you engage in communication, public speaking, and you don't work the process effectively, your public speech won't be as effective. Now let me give you one more example. So the example that I gave you about doing the morning speech on Friday, and it was 30 minutes, and it was about laughter yoga. In the end, I went over to the person who put themselves way out there in the corner, and I, I could tell it wasn't someone who really wanted me to be touched. So I did this right here, and I was like, hey, I just want to thank you so much for participating. And the person did a fist bump, a boop, you know. <laughs> we didn't explode it. I mean, it was just a little bump. I said, I just want to thank you so much. And she stood up, and she said, you know what? I want to thank you. She said, this was so excellent. She said, I'm going to have a great day now. I can't believe how good this has made me feel. Thank you. That to me told me that I had an effective public speech because I engaged in the process of public speaking, putting that message together and thinking about all of these components and then going out there and doing it and having fun. All right, this concludes our lecture for public speaking. So think about this right here, definition, think about all the components that we talked about, and start thinking about that one minute introduction that you're going to do with someone, but you'll do it in chapter two, okay? Thank you all so much for coming out here and joining me. Um, your, as your pocket professor gives you your very first chapter lecture on the process of public speaking. Thanks for joining me.